So, a first in a series of talks where we're going to be trying to introduce um, practical MPC. So, let's um, see what we're going to be doing. So, in the first section of the course, we're going to be discussing what is multi computation, what is uh, fully homomorphic encryption, and how this can be used to do a very, very simple MPC protocol. We're then going to be looking on, going on to look at coding theory and secret sharing schemes and how they're related. And then we're going to kind of generalize those, those kind of things, which are based on Reed Solomon codes to more general, um, what's called access structures. And we're also going to look at full threshold access structures. This is what the first component of the course is going to be about. So the first big question is, is what is multi-party computation? So, uh, multi-party computation, it's kind of in the title. It's, multiple parties coming together to compute something. So let's assume we've got n parties, p1 to pn, and each has got some input. Now what you want to do is we want to compute a function of their input in a way that doesn't reveal anything about their inputs. Everyone learns the output of the function, but all that's the only thing they learn. They can, of course, infer stuff about parties' inputs. So for example, if we were computing the average height and we had two parties, if I give my height, into the um, uh, protocol and you give your height, then if we both learn the average, it's quite easy given my height to work out what your height was, okay? But if we had three parties and I was trying to work out your height and but I only saw the average height of me, you and someone else, it's a bit more difficult, okay? So that's what we're trying to do. But we also have to think about how bad people can interact with this protocol. And so what we have is we have a set of parties called a subset A, which is contained in P, which denotes the set of bad people. Now notice that's different from normal encryption. In normal encryption, you have Alice and Bob. They're the set of parties engaged in the protocol. But the bad person is the person outside the protocol, okay, is Eve. Here in multi-party computation, we're interested in bad people actually engaging with the protocol. And so that's a much more difficult task. So we've got various properties we could have of multi-party computation. There's correctness, which means if the bad guys do not deviate from the protocol, if everyone does what they're meant to do, we actually get the correct output. So in other words, if no one is bad, the protocol does what it says on the tip. It gives you the output of the function and it's the correct output. Let's look at passive security. So what does passive security mean? Often called honest but curious. So in an honest but curious uh, protocol, the parties, even the bad people, honestly follow the protocol, but they're curious about what the other party's inputs are. So they honestly follow, but they're curious about the other party's inputs. However, that's kind of weak form of security. It's kind of like a, akin to passive security for encryption schemes. And just like the passive security for encryption schemes, you have active security for encryption schemes. We also have active security for MPC. Now, in an actively secure protocol, parties can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol. They can do whatever they want. They can send arbitrary messages. They don't have to do what the protocol says they can do. So what can we do here? Well, you could have what's called a robust actively secure protocol, which means that if the parties deviate from the protocol, the bad guys, but the honest parties are still able to obtain the correct result, which kind of means that if the adversaries input errors into the protocol, the honest parties can correct from those errors and still get the right answer. So robust active security is very closely related to error correction of error correcting codes. On the other hand, what we have is we have active security with a bolt, which means if the parties arbitrarily deviate from the protocol by, protocol by entering erroneous messages, then the honest parties detect this and then abort. So active security with a bolt is closely related to error detection in error correcting codes. And it turns out that active security with the bolt is one of the ones that's really, really important in practice. Um, and it's easier to obtain than robust active security. And it's the one that we can, we can achieve for the important case of two-party computation. Okay, so what are this set of bad guys? Well, so suppose we had um, four bad people, then the set of all possible sets who could be bad is called the adversary structure. 
Now, an important uh, set of aperture structures that we'll focus on over and over again in these talks is that of threshold aperture structures. So imagine we take four parties and we have threshold two, then the total number of possible, well, the total sets of possible bad guys could be party one on their own, party two on their own, party three on their own, party four on their own, or party one and party two, or party one and party three, or party one and party four, party two and party three, party two and party four, or party three and party four. But you can't have party one, party two, and party three acting together as a bad guy, okay? So that's what you mean by having threshold two. Okay, and you can clearly generalize that. Okay, so that's one set of properties. What other properties do we want? I mean, it's, it's, there's just so many definitions that it's, it becomes really, really confusing. Okay, so we also have, how does the bad guys determine which parties are gonna be bad? Okay, so you can imagine that there's four honest people engaging in a protocol and the bad guy then actually corrupts which parties he wants to corrupt. So we've got four parties. What happens? So in a statically secure protocol, before the protocol starts, the adversary has to decide who he's going to corrupt. So for example, he might decide to corrupt party one and party three at the beginning, and then the protocol runs. That's static security. In adaptive security, what happens is, is the adversary has sees the four parties, he lets the protocol run for a bit, and then he goes, hmm, okay, party two looks like they're doing something interesting, I'm gonna corrupt party two. So he then goes in and corrupts party two. Then he waits for a bit further, and then he decides, now I'm going to corrupt party four. So he makes his choice as to who he will corrupt and, and take over, depending on the messages he sees in the protocol. Now, adaptive security is really hard to obtain. So most protocols in reality actually focus on static security. And you can do adaptive security, but most of you see in the literature really focus on static security, or they're presented in terms of static security to start with. Okay. So we have the adversary structure, we have whether they are honest but curious or whether they're actively secure. We have whether they're static security or adaptive security. They're just endless definitions, okay? So there's two. What, how do we bound the security or the, the computational resources of the adversary? So there's two key ways of doing this. What's called information theoretically bound adversaries or computationally bound adversaries. And this is exactly what happens in encryption schemes. If you have an information theoretically bound adversary, then we have a really, really fast encryption scheme, um, the one-time pad, which is very easy. You just saw a message, message with the key, but it has problems. It has, it's hard to manage. It's you know, not as adaptable as, as other schemes. Or we have, if we bound the adversary, we make some computational assumption, it's hard to computationally break AS, it's hard to factor numbers, it's hard to solve discrete log. Then we have what's called computationally bounded adversaries. And we have exactly the same happens in MPC. Now, information theoretic MPC is again really fast because it's a bit like just sawing stuff together. However, the restrictions are is that we can't cope with all possible adversaries. So for example, you can't achieve passive security if t is greater than or equal to n over 2. So you actually have to have t is less than n over 2 to have a protocol which achieves passive security, which rules out the case of n equals 2, because at n equals 2, that, that means that t is equal to 0. There are no bad guys. So we've got a limitation on what we can achieve with passive security. Again, we also have a, a limitation on what we can achieve with robust active security, which is T is less than N over 3, which is exactly the same as the Byzantine General's problem, which is not surprising because remember, robust active security is a bit like error correction. So this T is less than N over, N over 3 comes from the error correcting properties of Reed Solomon codes. Active security with a ball is again, we can achieve if and only if T is less than N over 3. Uh, is less than n over 2. And notice these are all if and only if. We can obtain the protocol if the bound is met. If the bound is not met, we can prove that there is no protocol. Computationally secure MPC is slightly different. It's slower, but we can ach achieve it for more, more elaborate adversaries. So for example, we can achieve passive security if t is less than n. So that's important because that includes the case of n equals 2. If we have want robust active security, we can only achieve that 
if t is less than n over 2, which again rules out the n equals 2 case. But we can achieve active security with a ball if t is less than n. So as you see, we might pay in terms of computational time and maybe some assumptions, mathematical assumptions we have to make, breaking AS is hard, factoring is hard or whatever, but we can achieve a, a, a more elaborate security infrastructure. So what we're going to focus on in a lot of these tests, uh, 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 talks, is active security with a bolt. And that's not the only thing you have to con consider. You have to consider whether your communication is a broadcast, whether when, you, when one person sends a message, it is broadcast to all people, or whether it's point-to-point -point channels. If you send a message and you want to send the same message to A, B, and C, you have to send the message three times, once to A, once to B, once to C. Whether the channels are encrypted, whether they're private, whether they're authenticated. It, we're going to assume that everything's going to be over synchronous networks, which means that if we have a line in the protocol which says send a message to everybody, then all the messages get sent and all the messages get delivered in one time step. That's not how the internet works. Messages get delayed. So these are called what are called asynchronous networks. And the problem with asynchronous networks is if you're a knowledge person and a message is delayed coming to you, you have no idea whether that's because the network is rubbish, whether the adversary has stopped an honest player sending a message to you, or whether it's the adversary has decided not to send the message to you. So asynchronous protocols are much, much harder because we have to deal with this issue of we don't know when we got a delay, whether it's a delay that's adversarial or the delay that's just inherent in the network. So we're going to be focusing really on synchronous networks. And also, once you have synchronous networks in the real reality on the internet, you're really going to be doing point-to-point -point communication. Now, because in an MPC protocol, you actually want to know who you're computing with it's common that you want to do this over authenticated channels. You can get away with non-authenticated channels if you have your protocol in some sense authenticates to people already. But you really want to, you, you want to know who you're computing your average height with or you're, you're doing your drug discovery if you're a drug company doing MPC or whatever. So you're going to have to authenticate channels. Now, if you're going to authenticate channels, you're going to do this over TLS. And if you're doing it over TLS with authenticated channels, you might as well encrypt them. So we might as well assume that we're actually running TLS over private encrypted channels. Okay, so that ends the first of the uh, of our introductions. Now there seems there'll be a lot of uh, definitions. We've had to talk about what, what type of channels we've got. We've had to talk about um, the type of adversary structure. We've had to talk about whether we want active security, passive security, adaptive security, static security. But we're really going to be focusing mainly on uh, active security with a bolt static adversaries and synchronous networks. And we're going to assume everything's over TLS. So that kind of summarizes where we are. And in the next uh, lecture, whilst my cat gets in the way, we're going to be looking at um, how we can build an uh, MPC scheme, assuming we've got fully homomorphic encryption. We're going to be a very trivial, passively secure MPC scheme, but that's where we're going with the next of these talks. See you then.